Okay. Hi, I'm Michelle Chung, outside the 361 courthouse where the Forsillo sentencing uh, wrapped up just a few minutes ago. I'm here with Joseph Neuberger, who is a criminal lawyer and has been following the Forsillo trial. So I'm going to just ask you first, six years, like, what is the significance of a six-year sentence for a police officer? Very significant. This is the first time in a very long time where any officer during the course of their duties has been sentenced to such a significant period of time in jail for an offense that occurred during the course of executing their duties. Very, very significant. It's a very crushing sentence to Mr. Facillo and his family. Well, what do you think the tipping point was? What, like, what, I mean, because what the judge had said was that the aggravating factors actually outweighed the mitigating ones in sentencing. So what was the tipping point? Well, the, the judge was very focused on the video. He said that the video provided very powerful evidence of what actually occurred in contrast to the evidence of Mr. Facillo when he testified. So he described how he viewed things. But when you take a step back and actually look at that video and have an objective view of it, you can see the circumstances unfolded differently than the way he testified to. Again, maybe his perception was a bit different. But there is a significant and powerful element to that video, which the judge has really seized on to declare in his judgment that, in fact, there's a high moral blameworthiness here, that the officer did not follow through with all of his training. And really what he's saying is there was alternatives to the shooting, which occurred the second set of shots. And so that's why we're seeing more aggravating factors really being fundamental in the judge coming with a six-year sentence. Do we know of any other officer in this country that's actually been um, convicted and sentenced to six years in a penitentiary? Not to my knowledge. I mean, it may have occurred, but in my 24 years of practice, I'm not familiar with that. And I think what that speaks to, frankly, is that across Canada and in Toronto, we have police officers who are generally well-trained and do an excellent job in de-escalating and managing the conduct of others that they come in contact with. So that's very fortunate. But this is a very significant uh, decision, and it's very significant because also in this case, the officer is receiving the mandatory minimum sentences under the criminal code. So there is this constitutional application saying because he's a police officer, he has to carry a gun. So he has to carry the sidearm. He should be exempt from that provision, and the judge is saying no, that he finds no constitutional violation. He'll be sentenced like everybody else. Mm. And, I mean, we, I, I should ask you now just about, sure. I mean, the the there. I think some people, I've had, I've had people come up to me and ask me, so why, I don't understand how uh, um, that uh, Officer Frasillo could have been um, found not guilty of second degree murder right. and then found guilty of attempted murder right. when the person died. Right. Can okay. So that? I can, and, and we can only do this in law, but the jury got it. And, and this was a very intelligent move by the Crown because they added the attempt murder charge. So what we'll do is we'll break it down. So first of all, in order to find second degree murder, the jury basically would have had to find that he was not acting reasonably in the circumstances. Clearly the jury accepted that because of the conduct of Mr. Yatim and how it was perceived by Constable Frasillo and that he felt that there was an imminent risk of danger or death to himself or the officers around him, that he was justified in using the force that he did. And they're trained that when they shoot, they shoot to kill because it's to incapacitate the person who can cause this harm. However, when you take a look at that video, and you see that there is a break. There's a six second break. And I know six seconds doesn't sound like a lot, but these are very trained officers who understand difficult uh, explosive situations. And if you count to yourself six seconds, it's a significant period of time. This is between the first set of shots and the second set of Correct. shots. The first set of shots actually killed him. Correct. Eventually we're gonna kill him. And then the second set of shots would have wounded him. Right, so there's two volleys of shots. The first are fired in medical uh, terms. It actually resulted in his death. But Constable Facillo did not know that at the time. There's a six-second break, and as his testimony indicated, he's assessing the situation, and then continued to shoot another six bullets, I believe. Uh, and that in and of itself at the time results in an attempted murder because he doesn't know that Mr. Yatim is dead. He's shooting now to kill. But the judge, the jury had found that, in fact, he didn't have to shoot because it was not reasonable. There was no imminent risk at that time because he was incapacitated. That's where the video comes in, and it's so powerful as far as the evidence is concerned. So that's how you get the attempt murder conviction and not a second-degree murder conviction. And you still may have to think about it a little bit, but it makes perfect sense in law. And when you really watch the video, you get there's a first volley of shots and then a second volley. I just want to mention that we are going to be taking questions for uh, Joseph. So if you guys, if anybody has anything to ask, please, you know, send them our way and then I'll, I'll put them to him. But sure. in the meantime, I just have, so I just wanted to ask you though too, we were all wrapped up. 
Forsillo was already handcuffed and was yeah. starting to be led away. And we were all getting ready to go. And then the judge said, oh, wait a minute, I have one more thing to say. And what right. he said was that he said to uh, Forsillo's lawyer, Peter Brody, that he said, your, your, your client has not uh, expressed any remorse and that I want to let you know that it has not affected the sentence that I've um, issued, but that he should not be given any leniency. Right. So in law, even after a trial where somebody's convicted, and we know in this trial there is a legitimate issue with respect to the second degree murder. So after the trial is over and somebody's convicted and they're about to be sentenced, there's two things you can do. One, you can express remorse through the sentencing process by making a statement to the court, providing a letter, or doing something of that nature, which Mr. Facillo declined to do. And also, even when testifying during the course of a trial, these are complex facts where, again, it's not it's hard to perceive that any police officer on any given day will go out wanting to kill an individual or a member of the public. There could have been an expression of some greater understanding and remorse for what has resulted as a result of this tragedy. And that really was sort of absent in his testimony. So it is unusual for the judge on the way out to make that statement, but you can tell from his honor's decision that he was troubled by the aggravating factors, troubled by the behavior, he clearly concluded based upon the evidence that really there were alternatives here and that Mr. Yatim didn't pose any type of imminent threat and there was no real expression and understanding of the enormous nature of this tragedy by Mr. Facillo. So he did not discount, give him any credit or benefit to expressing that type of remorse. So possibly uh, any, any indication of remorse might have helped him? Maybe. I mean, the judge gave a six-year sentence. The Crown is asking for eight to ten years, which really was out of the range. Five years is the mandatory minimum, which is stuck with under the criminal code because that's prescribed by Parliament, so our, our government decides what are mandatory minimums. So he's really stuck. He gave an extra year on top of that because of the aggravating factors. So he's really somewhere, I, I know he's not close to the defense position, but he's in a very fair range on an attempt murder. So he might have got some benefit for it. It certainly would have been it sort of would have helped with healing and some form of reconciliation. It's clearly difficult for uh, Constable Facillo and his family, but it's equally as tra tragic and, and difficult for the family of Mr. Yatim and for the community, which has been closely following this case. Okay, we got a question. Sure. So uh, Ryan Hook asks, uh, sorry, I got to read this okay. out here. So it's, he says, uh, what does this mean for future sentences for cops and how do cameras and being able to watch the videos right. of these altercations affect the sentencing versus if we do not have the luxury of body cameras? Right. So this is a very good question. So um, if there had been no video recording, so the video recording provides an objective observation in real time of what happened. If that doesn't exist, you may not even have a charge because the, the witnesses there, and I'm not casting aspersions, but the witnesses are the officers. So you're going to get their perception, but perception does not always equal reality. So they may testify or give evidence about to the SIU unit what they perceive as happening, but there's no objective recording. The video that captures the interaction is incredibly powerful, just like the judge said. It's all the difference in the world for actually the laying of the charge, what the jury had to do in assessing the evidence because it was highly instrumental in the jury concluding not guilty on second degree murder, guilty on attempted murder, and you can see how significant a factor it is in the actual sentencing. So I think this video recording is incredibly important. Well, and I mean, and, and so what about body cameras? I guess then yeah. we could see a lot less of the he said, she said, or he said, he said, yeah. and more of the, well, this is what actually happened. Yeah, and there's a pilot project going on now. How far that will go with Toronto Police and other police services, I don't know. I know they've been trying it in the United States, but it falls off during the course of a struggle. So I, I think it's a good practice because this will provide police officers with an objective recording so they can be protected too against false allegations. Those things happen as well. It also is a, a clear depiction of what a person who's being arrested will do. And it can provide very powerful evidence at trial if somebody's on trial for a criminal offense. So it's a win-win for both the Crown in a criminal case, but it's also a win-win for public safety because then there's a recording of what happens. Whether these body cameras will, you know, be actually effective in capturing all of what's happening, I'm not sure because it can be a narrow focus. And this person was stepping back from the scene and taking the video of it. But I think it's a step in the right direction. Okay, we've got another question from uh, Elsie Sabo, who says, I know it's a silly question, but will he still be collecting his paycheck? Well, so, because, yeah. what was, because under Ontario law, my understanding is that 
if he doesn't spend one day in jail or in prison, then he will continue to collect his paycheck as long as he's a police officer. Correct. So right now he would have been suspended with pay, and there's been no Police Services Act prosecution against him. So after a criminal case is over, then the Police Services Act comes into uh, play, and that's when he can be prosecuted for conduct unbecoming, et cetera, et cetera. So in this case, this is just the end of the criminal case. He is still receiving his pay right now. And if I'm correct, it will continue because I'm sure 100 percent there will be an immediate appeal. Right now, I'm sure they're in the Court of Appeal arranging his bail. So it will continue until this is finally dealt with, either by the Ontario Court of Appeal or maybe in the Supreme Court of Canada. Well, and that's something else as well. What we note, what we note is that in, in a lot of cases with police officers, there is a long period of appeals yes. and, you know, and where it just carries on for years and years and years until people kind of think, oh, wait, is that still not settled yet, you know? Yeah, but, I mean, this is what's great about our system. And, really, we have to be proud of our justice system because it really does come to effective resolution of cases, and we need proper appeals. We need to be able to make sure that if there is any injustice, it can be corrected. So we have a strong court of appeal. We have a great Supreme Court. You can appeal all the way up. And if there are any errors, then that can be dealt with. And I think this is very important from both perspectives, because as a society, if people are being prosecuted, we need to ensure that people are only convicted on really strong evidence that's proven beyond a reasonable doubt. And we have checks and balances in the system. So it may take a long time, but that's in all our interests. Well, and so my understanding, as, as yours is, is that there has, there's an appeal that's already being filed as we speak now. Yes. So what would happen in a situation like this is prior to the sentencing, in anticipation of your client stepping into custody, you'll file materials in the Ontario Court of Appeal for what we call bail pending appeal to get him released uh, in lieu of the appeal that he's going to do in the Court of Appeal. So he has a right of appeal. He's going to exercise that for sure. There's a legitimate constitutional application with respect to the mandatory minimum on the guns. I think these are always good constitutional issues. I think that was a, a very good one to run. And so that's going to be canvassed as well as the other issues and also the sentence itself. Right. Uh, he is in jail right now. So the minute that he was handcuffed in court, yes. um, that's he's now incarcerated. So he will be in custody. He'll be held in the cells. And uh, within... A short period of time, if not already, some type of hearing will occur in the building just over there, which is the Ontario Court of Appeal in front of a judge, and Osgood he'll receive Hall. Yeah. on Osgood Hall, and he'll receive probably on consent a release with specific terms. So he should be out by the end of the day, if not sooner. Right. So and, in other so in other words, he's not really he's even though he's in custody, he's not considered in prison. So that's why he can continue to collect his paycheck, but also that you know he can be home. Right. For the long weekend. I right. Guess. Well, he'll be released from custody, so he'll be out pending the appeal. And we give respect to the appeal in the sense that that's something that has to play out as well. And, of course, we have a very seasoned judge. Justice then is extremely experienced, has done heavy cases. I mean, this is a very experienced, intelligent judge. So it'll be an interesting appeal. But he has that right, and we exercise that right, and we respect it. And then he has an entitlement to bail. He's not a risk at large to the community. He has a family. So that process should go on while he's out. But he'll be on a strict bail, but that's appropriate. Okay. So it's not over yet. I mean, no. how long do you think this could go? How long could this go on for? Well, this appeal can take an upwards of a year to two years to be heard. Um, I'm sure they've already been working on it since the conviction on the attempt murder. But we could be looking at about a year to 18 months to have an actual appeal heard. And then the judgment can take some time afterward as well. Then uh, there could be an appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. So we may be looking anywhere from 18 months to four or five years for the complete completion of this case. And in that period of time, is, will there also be like an internal uh, um, investigation, like as an, a disciplinary hearing f uh, in, within the police? Yeah, there, that would have started at the beginning, but it will be held in abeyance yes. pending the completion of the criminal case. So they will not be pursuing any type of disciplinary proceedings under the PSA, the Police Services Act, until this process has completed. Do they wait until after the appeal or are they going to do the, Do they start the investigation now? Uh, some form of an investigation would have began. But being able to take it a step further, it will be held in abeyance. It will be stopped. And any defense lawyer would not have their client participate in that proceeding to jeopardize their right to remain silent, etc. Even though it's testified now, we don't know what appeal court can do. I mean, I have my suspicions, of course, but, you know, we don't know what an appeal court can do. You know, maybe in some manner it gets ordered back for trial. So that process has to be put on halt right now. My cameraman's talk. So yeah, that's so, okay. It's a good question. Yeah, so, yes, I mean he will, but again, he is a. Question. He'll get paid potentially. Let's say this takes four years, he'll still be earning an income for four years. But we shouldn't focus on that. I mean, he has a family. He was working as a police officer. He needs to support his family, and this is still legitimately before the courts. So I think that's appropriate in the circumstances. The real issue is dealing with the facts on the merits and making sure that the conviction, if that's what is sound, 
is upheld by the Court of Appeal. Or if there's an injustice and there's a wrong and the constitutional application was correct in law, then that should be dealt with appropriately. All right. Well, I think we're going to wrap this up here. I think okay. we're done. But thank you so much for my being pleasure. With us. And thanks for answering some of those questions. I thought they were great questions. But they also, were good. That, yeah. I mean, I think this is a case that has been in the public, especially especially yeah. in Toronto. It really has been on a lot of people's minds. And I think that at least we see some closure for this part. But it's really to be continued. Isn't it? it is, and we'll see. I'm, there were changes to the use of fourth uh, use of force policies, and also procedures used to try and de-escalate. Because we have a lot of cases that involve mental health issues, and we have to be very sensitive to that. So, some good will come of this, and we'll see how it unfolds in the Court of Appeal. Thank you so much. My pleasure. All right. Thank you. Hope you guys had fun. That's great. Hi,